We didn't call to order this meeting of Clay Township Board of Trustees for Tuesday, September 9th. If everybody will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before us, we have the agenda as we presented. presented. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections by fellow board members or department heads at this time? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an addition to communications from our resident. Okay. Okay. Any Anyone else? Under concerns of trustees. Of trustees, Clint Zimmer Ditch. Her flight. Any additional? Okay, the agenda will stand as amended. Um, I'm going to let the record reflect wherever we're at at 6.15. We will have a hard, immediate stop to adjourn the public hearing for a zoning amendment, and then we'll pick back up with our business as scheduled. The first item is the sheriff's report, to which I have nothing noted. Is there anybody in the crowd that wishes to address the sheriff's office with any concerns or matters? Okay. I'll close out the sheriff's report. We're going to turn it over to Detective Cohen for the detective's report. Uh, thank you. And the report for August 2014, uh, we had uh, 868 calls for service. It was a 1.6% increase compared to uh, what we did August 2013. Uh, we had 52 crashes, those were down. Uh, 12 crashes with injury, which was about the same. Um, 105 alarms, 248 traffic stops with 93 citations and 36 arrests. Uh, we had, alarms were up quite a bit compared to last August at 19%. Traffic stops were greatly increased by 55%. Uh, I handled seven follow-up uh, investigations with four closed cases, an aggravated robbery, a vandalism, a robbery, and an assistant other agency. And then again, I attached the um, kind of the charts with the the calls for service and how we're tracking it compared to 2013, as well as um, just a chart for August and how we did. Report. Um, nothing under unfinished business. It's going to take us to new business. I'm going to turn that over to our administrator, Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Item number one is to enter into a contract with the Stark County Sheriff to provide a school resource officer to the Plain Mobile School District for the 2014-15 school year in an amount not to exceed $61,967.16 to be paid from Fund 09A10B and to further resolve that the Plain Local School District shall reimburse Plain Township in an amount equal to one half of the contract. And that is not to exceed $30,983.58. And they shall reimburse Plain Township within 30 days of receiving the invoice for the utilization of the school resource officer. I will so move on new business number one. I'll second it. Discussion, just as a point of clarity. Now our contract cost has had to slightly go up. That takes into account essentially the set union negotiation rate, rates out through the sheriff's offices. It does. Um, it had not for the last nine years. For some reason, this was overlooked. So it is now up to where it should have been all along. So we did receive quite the bargain for quite some time. So it does include that all now. So we are where we should be with that. And Ken, just for the record, I know we've every year made it a point to note that the purpose of investing in this resource officer has to do with the fact that it keeps our other patrolmen out on, out on the streets and actually helps mitigate a lot of stuff potentially before it even happens given the relationship that the students develop through the level of trust and so forth. So this is 
indeed a uh, good thing for the township and the schools. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Lino? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. And Mr. Hobbs? Yes. Number one. Number two. Item number two is an FYI, just notifying the board that uh, Mr. Icino and myself have put together and applied for the Linford OPWC grant uh, for this year, and it uh, has been submitted. Mr. Hawes uh, has signed off on it this year as president of the board, and we are hopeful that um, as many times as we have applied, that uh, they will look favorably upon this project and we will be granted uh, the funds. Chad, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, as the board knows, we've had problems for years on Linford. Um, this is for the lower end. Of, we have to do the lower end of Linford before we can do anything else. So this will go from 45th Street to 49th Street, take care of all the hills that are running into Linford. It's a $1.4 million project. Can you repeat that how much it is? $1.4 million. Um, we have, this is the sixth year in a row that we've applied for it. And after speaking with our engineering company, we're hopeful that maybe this could be the year. Because we've already set aside the uh, matching funds. Match, match, match funds. And that also will fulfill everything on our end. It will. Right. It's just, if I could, it's just a, a good effort that we have been trying. I hope our residents know that we don't let something like this rest. It's an expensive project. It's going to have to take grant to get it to move. We already have the matching funds. And I just want our residents to know that we're trying. That it's the best we can do. And um, if we get this grant, then, then away we go. Yeah. It's frustrating. People are being flooded, but it's just it's just too much for us. And hope that if we get this matching grant, and Joe, won't, won't that hopefully if we do get this and get this project moving, will that help anything coming towards the 55th Street area? Could it help? It will eventually, but we, we can't do. We had to do it in two phases because of cost, and we have to do the first phase first. You know, if we don't get the lower end done, we can't you know do any additional work uh, on the north end. I don't know if, um, hopefully, we don't have anyone from Linford over here. I'm not sure they're watching it on YouTube, but it would be nice if we got something out to those residents so that they know that we are making an effort. We're trying, and it's all we can do. But we're not sitting on this, and we haven't been sitting on this. No, we Outside of our media partners, like the most neighbor news and the rep, hopefully, talking about it, I think our website, our website and our social media will be just as a Mm -hmm. Informa informational purpose, you know, mm -hmm. the best way to do it, given mm -hmm. our newsletter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. OPWC is the only funding that it doesn't apply, CDBG funds don't apply for that area. So, OPWC is our best. Just, just mm -hmm. It doesn't meet the requirements, so. Okay. Thanks, Joe. That's going to conclude new business. That will take us to our fiscal officer's report. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Flax. Thank you, Mr. President. The first uh, item on the agenda is a request for resolution to authorize the payment of pending warrants in the amount of $88,401.69 is attached. I will so move. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Hobbs? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. Mr. Lino? Yes. So also number two is a request for a resolution to authorize the payment of regular payroll in the amount not to exceed two hundred twenty thousand dollars. I will so move. A second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Hahn? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. Mr. Lino? Yes. So officer number three is a request for a resolution uh, to authorize payment for the following medical claims that are provided by all care. I also move for you to pay. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Oz? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. Mr. Lino? Yes. This is number four is the uh, financial report. Stellar and stellar interest rates. This 
Fiscal Officer uh, number five is a uh, request for resolution uh, for authorization to, uh, as a refund for overpayments by uh, for emergency medical services requested by Ohio Billing. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Hawes? Yes. Mr. Reno? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. This question number six, um, this is a request for a resolution um, to adopt the attached updated uh, township procedures. I will so move. I'll second it. Discussion, just as a point, okay. this come from our internal audit committee. It meets um, some of the changes that are in here. Instead of having associates' names, we identify, identify the actual role, so whether it's trustee, administrator, specific department head, just for the sake of whoever's in that position. So some of it's uh, grammatic, grammatical from that aspect, but then some of it's uh, definitely ref refined based upon uh, re reports we've had back from you know, the state auditor on how to improve, improve the process and so forth. And thanks to Anthony's office and Lisa working on this. this one, uh, anything else? I think two of you would wish to do that just for the sake of record. Uh, yeah, I think most of it's just grammatical and just uh, getting rid of institutions and things like that, calling up financial institutions instead of specific banks, different things like that. Roll call. Mr. Lino? Yes. Mr. Giovesis? Yes. And Mr. Hobb? Yes. And that'll conclude uh, the fiscal officer's report for that. Thank you, Mr. Flex. That is going to take us back to our administrator for the administrators. Thank you very much. Now, item number one does not require a resolution. Just uh, letting the uh, board and members in the audience know that we will be sponsoring another e-waste recycling week from September 22nd through the 26th, which is a Monday through Friday from um, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Actually, I believe, Rob, is it 8 a.m.? 7 a.m. It is 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, what this is, is you can bring any electronic waste to the Plain Township Hall garage, which is located here, which means anything you can plug in, you can drop off to get rid of. So, um, really, calculators, radios, CDs, uh, TVs, um, keyboards, answering machines, telephones, you can bring batteries, um, anything really can be brought in um, and dropped off. We started this when the Solid Waste District stopped with their um, drop-offs that they used to do at Kent State Stark uh, to give our residents an opportunity to get rid of those types of um, electronic devices. No household hazardous waste will be taken, but again, just a way to get rid of um, electronic uh, Ways. So again, that is the 22nd through the 26th, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Item number two is the yard waste um, recycling for fall to let the board be aware that uh, beginning October 6th at fire station number four, uh, we will have our yard waste open um, Monday through Saturday from 8 to 6 p.m. and Sunday 12 to 5 p.m. This will be on our website, it will be um, on all of our social media, and also in our um, newsletter. Um, there's some holidays that will be closed, uh, for example, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, and then Thursday through Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend. And then following the Thanksgiving holiday, we return to the regular Monday, Thursday, and Saturday from 8 to 6, and then January 9th, the yard waste closed for the winter months. So that way um, it gives those folks who celebrate the Christmas holiday time to drop off their Christmas trees to the yard waste. Um, and then below are the, the hours for Solway, but most people are interested in those hours at the old fire station. So we will have that posted everywhere. And then item number three is a resolution for the Plain Township Board of Trustees to authorize payment to the Worsler Brothers landscaping for August 2014, an amount not to exceed $2,100 from Fund 01A26L. I will so move. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Mr. Lino? Yes. Mr. Gibbasis? 
Yes, Mr. Hobbs. Yes. And that ends the administrator report. Thank you. And that does put us right at 6.15. So we're going to adjourn from this regular meeting to the public hearing for zoning amendment number 557-14. With respect to this public hearing, we're going to ask that if there's anybody who's here to speak in support of the zoning, zoning amendment, that you state your name and your address for the fiscal officer for the record. Is there anybody here speaking in support of public hearing for zoning amendment 557-14? Gentlemen in the front row, can you just state your name and address first to start? My name is Brian Ashman. I'm part of my Cooper & Associates, 1359 Mark Avenue, Morgan. Um, whereas I, I'm going to be presenting some information relative to the uh, actual zone change aspects of the uh, request here and some of the engineering aspects of the request. Also attending here is a, uh, one of the members of the partners, Mr. Skip Ray, and he'll follow me with some discussion uh, with aspects to the actual uh, anticipated development uh, characteristics. Currently, the piece of property in question is located at 2766 Mount Pleasant Street. Consists of two independent parcels, both owned by the same individual, and it contains about 18.65 acres. Uh, the property is currently zoned for RR residential development, which is a 30,000 square foot lot with 100 foot of frontage. We are asking for approval of the rezone to R1 single family residential, which would allow the lots to be a minimum of 15,000 square feet with um, 80 foot of lot width at the building line. Uh, I want to bring something up with respect to the actual intended or the description of the purpose for each of the zones. The zoning code states that the purpose of an RR district is to set aside areas of township which are uniquely suitable for agricultural purposes and or which are environmentally sensitive as identified in the township adopted comprehensive mini master plan and provide low density single family uses within the rural atmosphere. This is the what we are currently zoned and uh, we don't feel that that is accurate for this piece of property. Uh, the R1 zoning is listed as being a purpose established to accommodate single family residential dwellings in areas that will retain the scale and character of existing residential neighborhoods. Um, this, subject, sir, this subject piece of property is certainly not agricultural. It's not been used for agricultural. It has been, or let's say certainly has not been used recently for agricultural. It is fairly, it is basically an open piece of property with a single house on it and some other appurtenances, but the current owner is uh, wishing to sell this, and there is a developer that is wishing to acquire this piece of property, rezone it to R1, and install some, and then design and install some lots. I'd like to offer for the board to purpose here some supplemental information that I'd like to be able to bring up. What I've done here is on the first sheet that I've given to you, I have uh, in, I've, uh, presented the uh, Pine Township zoning map on the bottom with the Lake Township zoning map on top. As you, you are well aware, Mount Pleasant is the township uh, zone line. What I'd like to do is emphasize a couple certain couple areas. The, the piece of property that we are looking at is that uh, is that green piece that the arrow is pointing at, that section there is the 18.65 acres. As you can see by this map, it is completely surrounded by R1 zoning, both in Plain Township and in Lake Township. The Plain Township R1 zoning is uh, considerably smaller, as I said, 15,000 square feet, lot from 30,000. Lake Township to the north, I know they don't really count in this decision, but it is looking at the whole general atmosphere of the property. 
uh, surrounding this. And uh, Lake Township, this is zoned R1, and their R1 zoning has a minimum lot size of 12,000 square foot, 80 foot frontage and width. So what I'd like to emphasize is that 30,000 square feet restriction for this 18 acre, which is one property owner, two different parcels. Is when you look at this, it almost is. Uh, it's almost evident that this is almost like a reverse spot zone. Here we have a piece that is RR surrounded by R1, and yet we're in an area that is not contiguous to, or or say in the outskirts of residential area where it would be beneficial to try to maintain this uh, rural residential 30,000 square foot lots. And for this purpose, we are classifying this as being the primary hardship that this piece of property is inaccurately zoned at the current time, in our opinion, and should actually have been zoned R1. We understand that this piece of property has been zoned RR for a considerable length of time, probably since 2001 I have a map. It's showed it as being RR. I'm not sure if I say RR or R1. It's been RR since 2001 at least. We're not saying that there's anything wrong, but that it was zoned RR, but it's not applicable to the situation that we have at this, piece, at this time. All the lots around us are considerably smaller. Uh, they're even smaller than what the R1 requirement required, uh, mandates of 15,000 square feet. Many of the lots around this uh, piece of property are only 8,000 square feet in size, 8,000 to 10,000 square feet. But we realized that when the zone change occurred, these were probably grandfathered in prior to the most recent zone change. Had no problem with that either. What we are trying to do is create a situation that, that has zoning that is uh, is comparable to the existing property. And the 15,000 square feet that is proposed with the R1 zoning is not just comparable, but it is almost 50% to, say, 75% larger than the existing lots that are out there. And we don't feel that 30,000 square foot would be applicable at all for this piece of property. We, when we were looking at this, we were considering rezoning to an R1A, which would have allowed us to be down to uh, 12,000 square feet per lot. But it was decided that we wanted to create a 15,000 square foot lot with a nice home on it, something as a step up situation. And Mr. Ray will talk about the home design aspect of this uh, in a few minutes. Uh, on, on, on the second sheet, what you're going to see, I, I did attach three sheets there. On the second sheet, it, it gives you, I, we understand that the zone change is not conditioned upon us providing a layout for lots or anything. But we have already made a submission to Stark County Regional Planning Commission for preliminary plat approval. And the second sheet that you see is that uh, plan. It shows the intention of the development by the developers uh, and the fact that we've already applied for the uh, preliminary plat approval indicates that their, their desire is to proceed with this layout. The lots that are presented are about 15, they're 15,000 square feet, larger, larger, and in conformance with the uh, township zoning regulations except this, uh, Denny had indicated he thinks that perhaps a couple lots right down there at the southeast corner, the lot, the lot width of the building setback might have been wrong, and he is correct. Um, so we are actually making an adjustment to that to reduce one lot. Uh, and what you will see on the third page indicates the adjusted, uh, the adjusted development with the uh, a little larger scale so you can see things, and it presents that uh, layout with one less slot, which uh, we'll be, we will be proceeding with. I'd like to state that the Regional Planning Commission did give us conditional approval for the preliminary plat. Not that that makes a difference, but it's conditional upon approval by the, the trustees and the planning township accepting the zone change as requested to an R1. I've given this third map for a couple reasons. Uh, anytime residents, certainly residents are always uh, concerned about a zone change in their neighborhood. And the most usual concerns has to do with 
the fact that they're used to seeing open space behind them and it's going to be developed. They don't like that. Our, certainly the property owner has a right to develop the property and in accordance with zoning. So even if we were not able to get an R1 zone, the, 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 the owner of the property could develop and put in residential lots at 30,000 square feet. The second reason that most uh, usually is uh, the, one of the large reasons for opposition has to do with the traffic that's generated by the development. We are proposing that we're going to have uh, 41 lots on this development, and I'm not saying that it won't generate some additional traffic. Uh, we have two points of access into the development. One is from Carlton Street, which is on the west side, and one is from Mount Pleasant, which would be across from Abigail Street. Stark County uh, Area Transportation Department has done studies on the capability of the existing roads out here. And uh, Mount Pleasant Street, which was included in their study, was listed as being uh, either a classification A or B, depending upon where you were on Mount Pleasant. Both the A and B designations indicate that the existing conditions are well below the design conditions for the roadway. In other words, the allowable capacity of Mount Pleasant is much larger than what we currently have out there, and therefore the amount of traffic that would be generated by this development would not impact even that number A or B status that Mount Pleasant is currently given. Um, the local residential streets like Sandalford or Carlton, which is where we're coming in, those are not included in the SCATs, but uh, and those streets also, uh, from my review of it, would not have any problem in accepting the additional small amount of uh, traffic that would be generated by this development. Another issue having to do with traffic has to do with uh, the capability of having uh, sight distance on major streets. And the proposed entrance at Abigail has been evaluated and um, it, had, it will meet the ODOT requirements for intersection site distance. So we are not creating a hazard situation for the roadways that are, for the roadway that is connected to Mount Pleasant Street. That's another <coughs> concern often by residents stating that more accidents could occur because of the development. The third primary issue having to do with concerns of development uh, has to do with flooding. And, uh, more development means more rooftop, more pavement. More impervious area means you're going to have more runoff from your development. On this third sheet, I presented two different colored lines. One is a green line I called out as the existing drainage basin line. Everything to the east, of, if you have Mount Pleasant Point towards the top, everything to the right, which is to the east uh, the, of this drainage basin line, flows east and ends up going across residential lots with discharge to the existing street to the west, to the east of this development, which is, I have it on my, my sheet here, but I don't remember the name. I apologize. Um, well, whatever it is. On the east side of this plan, there's another roadway. There's a public roadway over there. All this drainage ends up going through some lots, especially, I would say, uh, lots of uh, the Williams parcel and the uh, Nathaniel parcel are severely impacted by the existing drainage conditions because the water's going down to the east, it's concentrating, it has to get from, from the existing property over to the public roadway where there's some receiving storm sewers that can accept this drainage. There even was an existing storm drainage easement that was put between the Williams and Nathaniel property that uh, from our review, my review, there's never been a proper storm sewer system put in there to be able to collect this water and keep it from rushing down and causing flooding on the adjacent neighbors. When the proposed development is done, um, we have specific design requirements that are mandatory that we meet and that we collect, detain, and release at a, at a rate that's prior to the discharge rate, existing discharge rate for all storms two through 100 year. We have to collect the rainfall, pull it back, we treat it for water quality, we detain it, and then we are planning to release it in a storm sewer that would go in the easement between the Williams parcel and the Nathaniel parcel 
down to the existing storm sewer, which is on the street that is uh, just in the east. By doing this, there will be no surface drainage coming off of this development going across our property line into the neighbor's properties to the east. We'll be collecting it in the area that I've indicated as the blue shaded area with the storm discharge where I've indicated that we will have a storm discharge pipe. This provides a substantial upgrade to the drainage concerns of the existing neighborhood and will reduce any flooding that they are currently seeing out there. And uh, we feel that that is a very good uh, benefit for the actual development of the property. I would like to just re-emphasize that this piece of property being this little isolated 18 acres up here surrounded by R1 zoning and lots that are even smaller than R1 zoning, in my opinion, should and we hope the trustees agree will be approved for this rezoning. Uh, you are aware that Regional Planning Commission looked at this and they have approved the requested zone change. You also are aware that your zoning board has reviewed this and had, we had a meeting and they also approved this for the you know, requested zone change. So I'm asking that you as the trustees do likewise and realize that the hardship for this piece of property remaining as an RR is that the developers don't want to go in and put in large lots with infrastructure and then have a situation that these lots can't be marketable because they don't blend, they don't match up with the types of residences, homes that are out there currently. So we, this is a hardship. You can't create lots on 30,000 square feet, blend it in and be able to market these lots. I ask that the township trustees approve the zone change and uh, if you have any questions I'll be glad to answer them or you can let Mr. Ray speak and then we can answer together if you would wish. Uh, our, pro our process will dictate that we'll have any individuals that speak in support of it, then we'll hear the arguments against and then we'll hear the questions. That's fine. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, later. Go ahead, trustee. Go ahead, trustee. My big, are you looking at the retention or detention part of all this along The It's going to be a detention. Our, thought is it's going to be a detention basin along that entire east side where that blue that blue area. Okay. Because you can show how many out here. The only worry I have is that the hundred to two hundred year rain, we're getting them. This year we've been hit so hard. Um, we have newer allotments that are what ten years old that we learned you and I went and visited that that we thought were put together well with detention ponds. And these people are being flooded. Um, are we looking very accurately that, are we putting large enough pipes in these? Because i got to be honest with you, before, in the past, we'd get that 100-year storm maybe, what, every 10 years? But now, honestly, I'm looking to see that we're going to be getting these quite often. <coughs> we're dealing with allotments right now that are flooding. And now we're talking a lot with the Joe and I went to that's only, what, this area was only built maybe eight years ago, and they're, they're flooding. So, that's my biggest concern. Are we looking at this in the bigger picture that we really got to handle these large storms? Because these large storms are going to be coming more frequently, I think, than we've seen. I think that's a very reasonable question to ask, and I'd be glad to give my response. We've not started our engineering on it, as so to speak. We have our intended layout. We've gone through. We're going through the preliminary plan process. When my firm designs detention basins, what we will do is we create a scenario, and this is an ideal situation because we have a storm pipe down on, what's the name of the road to the east? Woodruff? Yes. Woodrush? Uh, yes, Woodrush. The On Woodrush, there's an existing storm sewer system. It has sufficient size and capacity, and it was designed to pick up this drainage that's coming off of this existing property. We're going to be putting in what I expect to be, uh, on my preliminary analysis, uh, an 18-inch storm sewer from Woodrush up to our development. At our detention basin, we're going to be putting in a very small outlet structure. Maybe it'll be designed based upon the hydraulics that we have to do for the two through 100-year storms. But it might, be, it might be an outlet orifice that might be in the range of 8 inches or something of that nature. 
When we design the outlet structure, what we do is we normally get it up. If we have an overflow, if the basin is at this height, we have an overflow area in the, in the basin that allows it to go over the embankment so it doesn't just go over the top anywhere, normally one foot below. What we do then is we create, a, our control structure has an overflow set below the spillway, this emergency spillway, usually about six inches below the spillway elevation. That if, if the water gets up to that grade, it circumvents the small orifice that we have, goes over, goes into the 18-inch pipe, which then is transported over the Woodrush. And by doing this, we can it, it can usually handle storms much in excess of 100, but not until it goes over the overflow. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, Mr. Wayne? So we, we try to accommodate this. We do have specific design requirements that we must meet, but through the way we design it, we try to get it so it's beyond the limited or beyond the minimum design standards that we have. That's all I can say now because we haven't finished the design. Certainly. So, um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. In this development, will there have to be in, in any of these residents' backyards swells that you would be making for this water? Or no. Okay. All of the what we'll be doing is on our property along this east line. We'll be creating an embankment. Gotcha. And that, and then, it, so it goes up, and across, and back down. And then all of the stormwater management is to the west of the embankment. The embankment will be against our east, pro east property line, not on the neighbors, but on the, on the actual development's property. To the west of the embankment will be the detention basin area. Right My last question, because Joe and I have noticed that some of these developers, and I'm talking eight year homes, are eight years old, where they develop these swells or whatever plan for the water. They let the residents make their own, uh, put, plant their own trees, put their own fences up. And we ran into problems that we couldn't even get near these people's property now with water problems. That's, that's I'm just asking. Will you, will you guys keep a tight rein on, on these homes going up that residents aren't going to be interfering with this flooding? Well, we, we will be creating it through the planning process. We can put restrictions as to what the with the lots that have their backyards going into the detention basin. We can put restrictions as to what are permitted and what is permitted and what is not. <coughs> Personally, I won't be out there enforcing those restrictions, but we will incorporate restrictions that will say they're not to have fencing that prevents access in to be able to maintain these detention basins and be able to go into where the control structure is and make sure that it is cleaned out. There will be some sort of a, uh, an association created that is responsible for the maintenance of this basin and the outlet control structure. Okay, so we create that as part of the maintenance responsibilities of either the residents that are there or the homeowners association for the whole 41 lots for maintenance purposes. Not mowing, but making certain that we don't have debris clog clogging up the outlet control structure or anything of that nature. Thank you. Thank you. As far as the maintenance agreements with the homeowners association, what happens if the association disbands or the association is not active? That can be a problem. The reason why I ask is because of the drainage easement I had in my home in Kings Creek. I mean, when it sold it in, then it was overflowing and it became the property owners adjacent to its responsibility. Let me say two things. Um, as with regards to homeowners associations, we personally have seen over and over again those restrictions are only as good as the association becomes. And some, they sit there and they don't do anything about them, and some are on it and they take care of it. So, with regard to that issue, we've seen it go both ways. Secondarily, I'll have to keep my answers brief and very legal because I just bought one of the lots that. This is going right next to us. So, <laughs> so I live in, you look on your map there by the, the Price lot, which is right on the corner of Sanford and Carlton. I had no idea this was on the agenda for tonight. And uh, so if you have legal questions specifically, I'm happy to answer them. But anything else, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> we, when the plat is created, there is, the, the area of the detention basin will be put in an easement, a public easement which gives the right to, say, the township to
to be able to go in and do something, I, depending upon how the language is, but it also gives the county the right to go in and be able to go in and do the, uh, if, usually what occurs in a detention-based scenario is people go in and illegally dump materials, uh, dirt, whatever, to, and you lose your volume. Or people go, or you get debris that falls into the basin and it goes down and plugs up the structure. And uh, but by having the easements in there, there is the capability that this can be done by a public agency also. But I understand that there becomes then the situation as to who pays for that public agency to do it. I'm certain that there's legal ad legal criteria that's been established by maybe the county or something, but I'm not exactly certain how it's written now. <coughs> I just know from past experience and working with RPC on these detention and retention plots that they are all being set as homeowners association's responsibility. But this question has been asked for the last 15 years that I'm aware of. What happens when that homeowners association either goes defunct or nobody's taking care of it? It will come back on the township eventually at some point. It will have to take care of it. Oh yeah, because the county doesn't have Because it won't be on the county. Because it's on the start town. It's on the township road place. More than likely. Most of them will be on the township road. Alright. As far as additional they are needed though, don't get me wrong, yeah. all these retention new pension funds are needed. Oh yeah. This time I appreciate your comments, Mr. Ash, and that the gentleman Back row, please you state your name and your address for the record. And just speak to any new additional details that you may have that haven't already been touched upon. Hi, my name is Skip Bray. I live at 8230 Let's Avenue, uh, Jackson Township, and I'm uh, one of the developers, SRS Group. And uh, got a little thing here to give you about myself and the uh, group. We've been developing basically the last 40 years in Jackson Township, so done lots and lots and lots. We've been down all these roads. I've heard retention makes and runoffs for 40 years, so uh, we really, really tried to be uh, township friendly, uh, homeowner friendly, the whole thing. And I actually, we've got uh, this allotment. We're trying to model after this allotment we just finished up, Scottsbury Hills. On Amherst Road, Jackson Township. Uh, we have uh, where the current parade is, uh, even though I didn't go in the parade, we developed it. We did all the development all up through there. And we've got uh, two, two basic retention basins in there, and uh, both of them are on homeowners' existing property. And I could take any time you guys would like to go look at it, I'd take it, show you what we've done there. Those are detention ponds. Now, we've done some that are retention ponds, and they hold water. We've got, you see there, we've got Mudbrook, Mudbrook Estates, one of our allotments, and as you go down Mudbrook, you'll see the pond there, and that's a retention pond. And uh, Briarwood Hills, same thing, we have a huge retention pond. Now, there's a problem with retention ponds is after they grow up, they get real unsightly and no one wants to take care of them. Um, with the detention ponds, we're finding maybe part of their yard, it, it's, that section is yours, you mow it, and, and most people have done that, and they look nice. Now, temporarily, they're going to get water in them, but for the most part, they drain back out. We've never, I can show you Scott Bear, we have probably 100 houses in there, and <clears throat> we've never had a problem with uh, anybody's calling me saying we've, we've and we've never uh, started a homeowners association but we're done and the reason for that is we take care of everything now another lot that you'll see there is Aberdeen Aberdeen we got 370 houses in there and it's a huge huge area and we've got same thing we've got detention areas but yet it's uh, the difference there is that's part of a PUD and it's got a plan unit development and the homeowners take care of it. And, but we took care of everything until 
we're basically finishing it right now. Now, the only thing I'd like to give you, one of the reasons we went with uh, We went with bigger lots than what we thought. We thought we probably could have got the uh, R1As. But what we wanted to do was all, a little bit bigger houses. I want to do all three car garages. You can see almost everything I'm passing around. And we've been down all those roads with the smaller houses and the red barns in the backyard and the da 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 da. -da. So what we're trying to get is so that you have a place to put your cars, your mowers. Etc. And as you can see there, those are all current houses that we've been building in the last 10 years. And this is what I plan on building there. Um, we find that people people will want something like that. We've done, like I said, we've done really well with that style, that type. A lot of first floor masters, ranches. We still have some two stories, but more of the, the curb style of houses that are out there. Ray, what, what's the uh, estimated price range on these houses? Oh, house and lot? Yeah. What, what are 300, 300 and a quarter. You know, we're probably going to try to say 275, 280, mm -hmm. something like that to get started. But you, you, what we find is that people, the people we're selling mostly to, all want the upgrades. I mean, everyone wants brand for some reason. Uh, they want grand countertops, they want this, they want that. So those are the people that are coming to us who want new houses. And, you know, we're trying to, it's a it's a wonderful area. Uh, years ago, I, I built some houses in Bobble Lake, and you know, those are nice areas, but the houses are 20, 30 years old. And so we're offering, a, going to be offering a new house. We have 41 lots, and that's it. There's no more, no more else. No other place to go right there, and we can't go any larger than that. So, this is what we're proposing. We'd like to get approval. And any questions? Well, I'll be honest, and I, I've never met you, but I know you. Okay. Um, houses was my hobby. All right. And I could say comfortably that Skip Ray it was a very reputable name. I remember in the past. Um, know you to be uh, been through your homes and create homes. Um, I mean, if there's anyone here in this allotment that was concerned, I mean, again, this is not something that's planned. I don't know you. I'm just saying that you have a good reputation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Pardon? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank is, you. There, is there anybody else within the crowd here that wishes to speak in support of Zoning Amendment 557.14. Okay, that will now take us to anybody that's here to speak in opposition of Zoning Amendment 557-14. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board? No one to speak in opposition. Any questions or comments by the fellow board, board members on this? I would just add that this, you know, many people know this board is very cautious when it comes to something changes. Um, we look at these very seriously um, to make sure many of the possible issues can be addressed going forward as you can, not having a crystal ball. There's always things that are going to happen that nobody foresaw. But in the area that this is being proposed in, um, how uh, similar to the situation that we faced on Markdale Road, where all the surrounding property owners were zoned for multifamily except for the parcel that was in question. This is a reverse of that, where everything around it right now is on zoned family. And in my opinion, restricts the landowner from being able to utilize the property the same way it's being utilized around it. Um, I think it's an appropriate plan, um, even though they weren't required to show it to us, but um, I think it would be the best interest of the property if it would change in my personal opinion. Questions slash comments are going to go to the department's chief from a safety services aspect. Yes. Anything here that you would you know, denote to this, to this board 
regarding what's been discussed. Seen, obviously, the plan, but uh, obviously accessibility with the street review and the standard. Is it a cul-de-sac or on that? Uh, There's one inside. We talked about this, the chief. Is that the one we talked about? Yeah. Okay. So, and I am familiar with that. We did look at it and reviewed it, and I discussed it with uh, Denny regarding the, you know, the cul-de-sac and the radius of that cul-de-sac. So, that was our concern, and, and we talked about that. We worked about that. So. I think likewise, as Mr. Giovasis has noted for the record, um, reverse spot zoning. The fact is, is the area is developed over time, over time, and now this is the out, this is the outlier <coughs> up there. So I mean, we are we would be essentially prohibiting or restricting comparable use to the uh, current property owner for development pur purposes, and it's not the role of government to pick who's the win winners and losers. And this, if the plan meets the development criteria, that's imperative. I do want to be on record as I had an individual that had called, expressed a concern about the, tra about the traffic, you know, on Mount Pleasant, to which actually you've already spoken to that, Mr. Ashman, um, traffic count and so forth through there. So um, I don't necessarily echo that, that same concern based upon the, me the metrics. Sometimes perception doesn't measure what the reality is, and we see that in a lot of situations from, you know, when we get speed, speed, speed buggy requests, and somebody's going 50 through here all the time, and we find out there may be one, but we put everybody's had or under the uh, speed limit. <coughs> the fact that this does butt up against the existing model lake, and you've got St. James right, right across the road, if you've got comp comparable housing as compared to what's proposed here. And furthermore, I know historically we've always talked about zoning as a step down with the, with the buffers. I know, Lou, you've always hit on that, quite frankly, the fact that you went to the 15,000 and didn't push to go all the way to 12,000. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, I don't have anything further to note. Do either of my fellow trustees have any questions or comments? And just so for the record, so everybody knows, I don't think you can design a storm sewer that was going to handle the rain, some of the rains that we got this year. No. So that's just the stark reality. It's going to be difficult to do, but I know the type of system <coughs> I have myself now. It fills up and it goes right down and works at it. Um, I think that. They address my concerns. Okay. Well, I'm going to make a motion whereas a public hearing was held on September 9th, 2014 by the Plain Township Board of Trustees to consider amendment number 557 to the Plain Township Zoning Resolution and where such hearing was properly and timely held pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 519.12 and whereas the Plain Township Board of Trustees has duly considered the nature of the amendment and the reasons therefore the recommendation of the Plain Township Zoning Commission, the Stark County Regional Planning Commission, and the information provided by any and all other interested persons. Now therefore, be it hereby resolved by the Plain Township Board of Trustees, Stark County, Ohio, to adopt the recommendation of the Plain Township Zoning Commission for approval. Second. Discussion. <clears throat> Roll call. Mr. Lena? Yes. Mr. Gervasis? Yes. Mr. Hawk. Yes. That motion carries. That will uh, conclude our public hearing on number 557.14 at exactly 6.53 p.m. We will now go back to our regular meeting of the Plain Township Board of Trustees at 6.54 p.m. We will pick up specifically the fire department. I'm going to turn that over to Chief Snyder. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, item number one is the monthly report. Thank you. Thank you. Just give me a second, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, just, uh, just the fact that it was another busy month. You know, we had pushed over 400 calls a month, and that's three months in a row. Over 400 calls, and, and uh, this past week has been a pretty difficult week. Some of the calls we had. So, uh, but uh, overall, uh, you know, we're busy. We continue to be busy, and uh, the stats show that too because of uh, the amount of calls that. Uh, you know, I know June was up a little bit more than the other last two months because of, because of the storms and the rain. And in fact, there's we had during the month of June, but uh, July and August we didn't have that, but we still show a little more cost for the month. Knowing the, knowing the call volume, knowing the call volume combined with uh, some of the person personnel restraints we've been de dealing with, let the, let the guys know that thanks for the continued hard work is it's transparent to the public and the support that they give our uh, safety services. Both Fire AMS as well as sure. Sure. So I mean, point that out. The response time that's incredible. 400, no, we're 400 responses at an average of four minutes and 10 seconds. That's incredible. I'll let them do it. Okay. That concludes the fire department. It's going to take us to the road department. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Iacino. President, item number one is the monthly report for August. See a lot of drainage work done. 52 related work orders in August. Just as a point, point of clarification on this, 52 were those predominantly in areas that we've experienced flooding issues from back in May, or you know, was it sort of dispersed storm since June? It's a storm in June. Um, some of them were due that we never had before till that storm in June. Others are ongoing that we're trying to upgrade as we, as we can. Um, we also were able to do a very large project with the Star County engineers on uh, Beverly Avenue just south of Diamond Street. That runs, the ditch runs between Diamond and Market Avenue. Um, we did a co-project uh, together. The county did all the machine work and digging the home and it worked out well and our neighbors are very, very happy with it. Yeah. Item number two, Scott, you probably don't want to hear this very often. Um, it's a letter from Plain Township uh, Local Schools to continue the, for the road department to salt the school property located within Plain Township. It is understood the schools will pay the township for the cost of the work. It is also understood the Plain Township Road Department will perform the service when and if they can, depending upon the, road, the need, the weather need, and the need to be determined by the Road Department. This has gone on for many years. Um, every year we have to adjust the cost, the cost of salt, labor. We'll get that to you. Yeah. We need it. This is just a memo or this is for us? Yes, we always, uh, the board's always had them write us a letter requesting it. Thank you, Joe. As far as just a quick point on this, paving, we pretty well wrapped up on the paving or where we at? Like you the percentage of <laughs> yeah, what we got scheduled. Of course, we've got Snyder Road down before school opens. They are working on Diamond Road this week. And none of the allotment streets that they've done yet. And I'm giving made several phone calls to the contractor. And maybe, you know, the same old thing, we're behind, we're behind, we're behind. But I did remind him we have an October 1st deadline in our contract. Okay. So it's never happened that we've been this late. The bids were out in plenty of time. So we will continue to push them to get in here to finish all the allotted streets that, that will be left after that. Not too far away. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I keep telling from a, from, a risk, from a risk mitigation aspect, I think Trustee Lino brought up here. I mean, if we if we got close to that point, it potentially looks like they may not be able to deliver on full completion. What is our alter? What is our alternative to? I, I don't think it will be a, a. They might not be able to complete it by that October first, but as long as the weather stays above forty-five degrees, we'll be fine. What they'll do is they'll try to 
tell us it was because of weather. And it's always, we we'll have to go back and trace those days when it did rain, you know, to see why they wouldn't be here. But that's usually what the contractors will try to fall back on. Hopefully, this doesn't even happen that we get this done. Well, what happened on the radar, the fact is, is, the fact is, is they've committed, they've committed to a day, they know full well to take the forecast in a percentage of right. days. We actually, we're doing eight miles total this year, and we got um, down three quarters done on Snyder, and it'll be half, it'll be 50% after Diamond's done, but it's not going to be working. What worries me is that are they going to do a rush job on this? Yeah, right? We'll never let them have. We are on top of that. We have yeah, something this is with that. Like quality kind of, work. Yeah, yeah. And we're not rushing them because yeah. it's getting close to the element yeah. of work. We have our inspector there the whole time. The same contractor that's rounding the streets out, right? Yeah, it's the same contractor. He does the grinding and the paper. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Cheryl. That will wrap up the road department. It's going to change to the zoning department. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Fall. Thank you, gentlemen. Item number one is the monthly report for the month of August. Just to recap our event last Saturday, our first ever Bark of Palooza to help raise funds for the dog park and um, provide opportunities for, for pets and their owners to come out and enjoy the facilities and see what we have. It was very successful. It was actually a rain date from July 19th. Um, and it worked out well right up until about 12.35. Um, luckily, we were only open until 1. So a uh, nice day, uh, raised some nice funds for the dog park. and. Uh, all vendors were more than pleased. They've already asked to come back for a year or two, so we're in good shape moving forward. I was say that it was a real well executed event. I know I had the opportunity to stop over and partake. Thanks. We were we were pretty pretty pleased with it, and it was fun to see all sorts of pups and their and their human friends uh, out and enjoying it. Okay. Item number three. Um, just want to remind folks about the supper market. Our first one was last night. Uh, we are tweaking the time frame just slightly. We're going to go 4.30 to 7.30 the next three Monday evenings at Schneider Community Park. Uh, the food trucks are the Boca Loco Burrito Factory, the orange truck, 
and the donut lap. Um, men menus will vary, especially with the orange truck. And uh, it was a nice night. We, we see it uh, growing in momentum, and anybody who attended, I think, enjoyed the food and the atmosphere. And finally, just an update and a reminder to all, um, this Friday, September the 12th, we will be partaking in the um, United Way Day of Caring. Myself and the full-timers will be over at uh, Pathway Caring for Children doing some, some renovations as a part of the United Way project, and uh, we're excited to be a part of it this year. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. That's going to conclude the parts. It's going to take us to our law director. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Two items on the agenda this evening. The first is the George Hallis Drive annexation. This is the continuation of what was previously filed, and it includes an additional 0.967 acres. Uh, and talking at least a little bit, this appears to be probably the highest maintenance portion of the annexation. So I think this is a good thing. We probably do not want to oppose it. It's that brick area that I think is going to be uh, taken care of by someone else other than us, which is a good thing. So that's what this is here. Um, for your review, if you wanted to, in, in some circumstances, obviously we've raised objections with the commissioners. If we don't do that, we have 25 days from when it was filed. If we don't do that, then it'll just go through as an expedited type two. Just for the sake of the record, I mean, the prior, the prior annexation stuff, you know, we talked through it and we thought that it cleaned it all up, which is what I believe it must not have, so this is really the final piece that will... Yes, this is it. This is, this brings it all the way, and you can probably speak to it, Joe, I'll put you on the spot, but this brings it all the way out to the full road. Yeah. full road. It was the final 340-something feet. It still remains. Eric, did you uh, did you get the letter from September eighth? Not getting the letter. No. What is? We got a letter in that they're withdrawing the George House. Really? Oh, can, can we tell them we'd like them to file it again? That's what I thought was on the the agenda. When was no, I've got no, that no, petition. Okay. I didn't get I think that. This just came in today. Okay, that makes sense. It's it just dated it. September eighth. So they're withdrawing. So we'd like to ask the city of Kent to refile the George House Drive annexation so that we can get rid of that brick part up to full. I have no idea. I think it's the first I've heard of it. The letter just says uh, that the city of Canton officially withdrew George Hallis Drive annexation request from the commissioners. Um, it was submitted as an expedited type 2 annexation. Uh, it was filed on August 28th. If you have questions, we'll say it's It could very well have to do with that, Lisa. You're right. It could have to do with the media. They want to talk to us first before they file it so they don't ruffle feathers. Although on this one, I'm not sure if feathers would have been too ruffled. This area is not included in the media area. But they still had talked about Yeah, they talked still wanted to be doing neighbors. Or either that, or sometimes there's a technical defect, so they've withdrawn them on that basis. But certainly we'll touch base with them and figure out what's going on. I'll figure it out with them. Yeah. Cost. Yep. I'll call Sam tomorrow. Yeah. So we need to leave this as take. We'll take. If it's, yeah, if it's been withdrawn, there's really nothing to even do. We'll just take it off the agenda. Yeah. Thank you. And then. So look, number two is we're looking at leasing some space that we don't use at fire station, is it four? The old fire station. The old fire station. What do we call that? Just old fire station? Old fire. That's right. Uh, the Star County Deputies Association wants to meet there and, and do some stuff out of that facility. So I put together a lease. Um, we figured some expenses. We put a monthly amount in there, 200 bucks a month, about 2400 bucks a year. Some insurance provisions, things like that. Pretty standard lease that I put together for you. The resolution is just to agree to enter into that so that they can utilize that space under a lease agreement. I will so move on that. I'll second. Discussion. I think for the record we need to reflect it. We've taken a look at a number of different op options for this space from trying to convert it to another community room, community room based upon budgetary cost that that's prohibitive the fact that as well this agreement still gives us use of the rest of the facility the bays which essentially is what our parks and our road our road needs it does not impair in any way the fire's ability to train over there at the training facility 
nor does it impair our, our yard waste drop-offs. So all those are the critical function and the fact that otherwise our, our we would have straight expense in just keeping it clean, clean so it doesn't doesn't deteriorate, which our public constituents would fully expect. So the fact that we're covering the cost and the insurance is going to be covered by the deputy association for the, for their use of that space. Um, I know just given the fact that the good part, partnership we've had through the through the sheriff's department and so forth. Granted, this is a separate entity. A lot of the same representatives that are working and living in our community. I think this is a good functional use for for that space. Anything else, fellow trustees? Roll call. Uh, Mr. Javasis. Mr. Lino? Yes. And Mr. Hop? Yes. Okay, that's going to wrap up the law director. It's going to take us to communications. I'm going to turn that over to Mrs. Campbell. Thank you. Item one, number one, uh, Sheriff Meyer is sharing with the board as it relates to one of our former uh, dispatchers, Joe Scott. Uh, Sheriff Meyer wrote Joe a letter that reads, Dear Joe, I have received your letter of retirement effective October 1st, 2014, and I want to personally thank you for your service to the Stark County Sheriff's Office and many years of dedicated service to Plain Township and the citizens of Stark County. I wish you well in your retirement and both health and happiness in the future. Best wishes, George Meyer, Stark County Sheriff. With respect to that, given the number of years in which we had our fire dispatch located here out of Township Hall, the years of service given, I mean, is there something we we intend we intend to do recognizing his his years of service, whether it's on from the board or you know from the farewell? He had probably over 20 years as a volunteer firefighter, and then also dispatch. Well, as we get closer to that, I mean, whether it's a card or something, you know, something from, from the board. That's great. And item number two belongs to Mr. IFC now. Well, actually, it's a township-wide item. I received an email from uh, Diane and Jerry Rodak. Um, she writes, if I'm going to take that township and stall a deer crossing sign on our side street, Morales, near Easton Street. The traffic using the street is non-stop speeding. The sign will be threefold. Hopefully it will slow down the cars, which would assist in helping no accidents involving the deer, mama, and two babies, not, not to mention the extent of damage related charges incurred by the speeding of driver's vehicles. In addition to the walkers, children at play and bike riders. Many times I stand in the street to alert, alert drivers to slow down when I hope that a sign will benefit us all. Also, what is the zoning in Plain Township regarding a mobile home existing on an extra lot? I'd appreciate a response to both. This area is between Grove and Easton, south of Easton Street. It's one block long. Um, I checked our records, never had a deer problem there yet. I re uh, replied to her on this. As far as speeding, it is generalized at 25 miles per hour. It's stop signs on both ends. So, I don't know what the board would like us to do as a group. I guess either Bill in the, in the sheriff's office or me with a deer crossing signs. Or, I travel that with zoning. <laughs> I travel that stretch of road every day going home to work. And the close proximity to the stop sign from Easton to Grove is less than 200 yards. It's literally, if I floored my car, I, it would be difficult. I probably could, but I mean, it would be difficult to get up to a speed like she's talking about in that small section there. And like I said, I've been traveling through there for years, and I've never seen it here. I it's a contentious area right now. Uh, we all know that. Um, I've never seen deer in an area. There's not even woods on either side of that road. So. Well, there are some on the other side of Eastern, but I've never seen anything, right. like, anything on the south side. Uh, 
I addressed the issue regarding mobile homes. You have, yes, sir. I mean, we've done everything, frankly, from a legal aspect <coughs> and track control outside of our other options are left to set, set a speed wagon over there to show, show, show speed and then provide that report to the sheriff's office as well as a copy to the residents, which should something substantiate, obviously we could request at that point additional control during targeted times. I think we can speak to that for the sake of the resident, but outside of that, are we missing, are we missing anything here for viable options? No, I think take a look at the speed trailer and see. Yeah, I had a request for the rest of this week in the sheriff's office, and I think next week we can get that one out there. Back there, we well, respond, respond on behalf of the board, just let them know from a, we can get the speed trailer out there for a future date to be to be determined. Obviously, we've got some other areas that are already on the book, on the books to have it that are pri priority. I would just simply state that the stop signs, the close proximity of the two stop signs, should adequately address. I agree. I, I mean, the traffic that drives through there, Tom Morales, all lives there off of Morales and Grove and Dow and some of those side streets. So it's. Okay, I'll remember tomorrow. If there's any such a follow up, just let, just let us know. All right. Uh, so that. That wraps up communications. That is going to take us to the portion of the meeting, public speaks, where if you wish to address the Board of Trustees, we ask that you state your name and address for the record. Public speaks does carry a three-minute limit per, per speaker. So I will, I will adhere, have that adhered to. Is there anybody that wishes to address the Board? Gentlemen in the front row, if you'll state your name and your address for the record, please. My name is Bob Oates. I live at 2201 54th Street Northeast, just east of Linford Avenue. I'm here to talk about drainage and flooding. Uh, I'd love, like to start out by saying I am not talking about the flash flood of June the 16th. I understand that was a, probably a once in a lifetime flood. But as Mr. Lino said earlier tonight, severe floods are getting more common. Since that flash flood of June the 16th, there have been three instances where we have gotten two inches of rain or more in a very short period. I'd like to show the board some photographs from the storm of August the 1st. You can see what we're dealing with. There are eight homes there's a total of eight homes affected by that flooding, and the problem is the drainage on 55th Street is inadequate to prevent any water from coming down there. I'd like to give you all a Mr. Icino sketch and go through to the trustees. In the drains we have there. The drains that are on 55th Street, I walked over two days ago and looked at them. The catch basin between uh, 2130 and 2200 was installed about two years ago. It's filled with debris. It supposedly goes under the road and drains into a catch basin on the north side. And I don't know where it goes from there, Mr. Icino. Knows so. Yes, it, it, it goes west to the township city uh, boundary. Yeah. Then it goes south down a uh, city maintained uh, storm sort. There's also a catch basin between 2210 and 2218. <clears throat> that is very shallow. I'm going to say not much more than a foot. It's filled with debris. 
and it looks like a smaller than normal pipe leading out there. So that's very ineffective. The direction you see of the floodwaters coming between 2210 and 2218 55th, that is relatively new. We used to, for the 41 years I've lived there, it was quite common between 2130 and 2200 to have water coming down there. This other is relatively new and it just compounds our problem. You can see from those photographs how it's coming. It washes mulch, leaves a mess, it washed out our garden three times. Well, four times counting the flash flood, but I'm not counting that one. And so I'm here asking if something more can't be done on 55th Street to prevent some of that water from coming down south between 55th and 54th. Chuck, correct me if I'm wrong, but in that area naturally is a bowl area, so the water can travel. It's right. It's well. I have, I have elevations here. Okay. Um, Glen Hill, which is a block, a little over a block east of Mr. Oates's, the area Mr. Oates was talking about, is uh, 43 feet higher than Mr. Oates's property. Um, backyards. I know some of this water is street water. I'm not, not saying it's not. A lot of that water you're getting, Mr. Oates, we know. We've been through this. We've done some work on your property. It's backyard water from your neighbors, their downspouts from their roofs, <coughs> running through the backyard, getting to your property. The day those we thought, we, we, thought oh, we pretty much solved your problem a couple years ago. We had a small problem recently on 54th Street, west of you, in the city boundary lines. That we worked with the city and we finally got that repaired. Uh, there was two big sinkholes from the pipe collapsing down there. I don't know if you were aware of that. Yes, sir. The crews down there. Um, I worked with the city and my crews diligently. We got that all repaired. Um, I, I am meeting with your neighbor behind you. Mr. Wadalia tomorrow morning on his Mr. issues. Who? I think it's Wadalia. I'm not sure how you say it. Is uh, the pool. gentleman with the swimming pool? Yeah. I didn't know on his name. issue, I'm meeting with him in the morning at 8 o'clock. Um, without enlarging the, the system south of you, I don't know what can be done, to be honest with you. Um, can you not we can clean out the basins. That's not a problem. I wasn't aware that they needed to clean out. That'll get done tomorrow. That is true. Wouldn't it be possible to put a couple more basins and run it more across the street under the street like you did with that one? So it doesn't let that still route all the water all into the same drainage right. system. Right. The problem is the pipe on the north side is not probably going to handle it any faster, so they're going to back up anyhow at some point. Right. Uh, Mr. Lino and I have spent several hours sitting out there in rainstorms over the past four or five years. Spot, spotting them where they, where the water is coming across the road at from Aspen Valley, which is part of this watershed, is very large. This is one of the biggest watersheds in all of Star County. From there, all the way west of Market Avenue, all the way north of um, Easton. All this water comes down to that area, down to where the city just did that project that caused us some We'll get into that later. But there is a large watershed. This is why we've tried to work with OPWC to get a grant to start the lower end of this project to put in a larger pipe in so we can come north with it, take care of your problem, take care of your, all your neighbor's problems. Until I can get that grant, or this poor can get that grant to start that project. It sounds like you're talking to years down the line. Well, if it, we'll, yeah. we'll know before the end of this year whether we get it um, for this year. And we will continue to press to get it. Did I misunderstand that that grain is only going to cover the southern part from 45th to 49th? Yes, because we have to start at the lowest end, which this goes down to Nims, you know, Nimisillon Creek. We have to start there 
and we were only able to, to match so much funds at this time for this part of the project. Once that gets done, we can reapply again and once we get matching funds to do the northern part of the project. As of right now, the southern portion has not even been granted yet, so that that Correct. is just the hope at this point. Correct. Well, you haven't given me very much I, I will look at all this again. I will. I've been out there several times. You know that I have been out there. I have war quarters here with me, at least a dozen of them, for that area. For the new catch basins, we added on 55th over the last four or five years for the project we did on your street. Um, when we'll come out, I'll be out there tomorrow. I'll be out there at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning to talk to your neighbors. So we will look it all over again. If there's something we can add that would help, I just don't want to add catch basins that aren't going to help. If it's not going to help, you know, if we can find something, we will do it. So, for sake of clar clarity and understanding, has any of this property in the past 5, 10, 15 years ever had periods where there was open ditches that have since been piped and covered, which would slow the natural flow or throttle that water back and thus create the swell on the surface area at all? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. I, uh, at I one point, Mr. Oates had a, east, well, it wasn't really an easement, it was a kind of a drainage way alongside of his, west side of his house, with him, went in and dug a ditch there, and it worked for a while. Um, we now have a pipe there and a swell. Yeah. I was talking to Mr. Oates' son earlier this summer, and he said you were happy with everything until that big storm had, I guess. Well, I'm not blaming you for that big no, storm. I know. <laughs> but that ditch was 18 inches deep, 48 inches wide. That's an area of six square feet. The 12 inch pipe in there now has an area of about eight tenths of a square feet. That's why we added the swale on top of well, the The swale oh. has helped, but again, well, I can, the only reason I put that 12 is I can put a 60 inch pipe there, but it's not going to get out if the pipe below it's smaller. I can't. Well, I understand that. That's why the 12 inch had to go in there. I'm just trying to see whatever you can do to keep some of it from coming down that hill from 55th. There's two, two catch basins on the south side of 55th. That's it. Is, are you part of this letter? That That's be? my wife's handiwork. No. You better. Yeah. We. I look at this letter. I mean, it bothers me because Joe and I worked our butts off in your property, covering your ditch, covering that swell, putting a pipe in there for you, putting in catch basins, sitting at night with umbrellas, and then that letter. We made an honest effort here, Joe. Help me out here, but we spent some quality time fixing this problem. We, we, when I spoke to you last, you were happy. Your wife was happy. You weren't getting the water problems, and all of a sudden now we get a letter like that. It bothers me because you're acting like we have an excuse for not doing our job. And I spent a lot. How much time did we spend over there with this problem? Yeah, and time. these are just crazy rains. It's, you know, these flooding things. I'm going to agree with We've had three of them this year. Oh. Three since you were six months. I mean, what if we would have left that catch basin open and not put that pipe in? We had that water laying there. Maybe we should have left that ditch open. Then. I don't know. We covered that ditch because they wanted to come. We spent quality time there, hours and hours, Joe and I, with the umbrellas watching this rain and ha thought that we had a happy solution, but these rains have been crazy. Well, I agree, I agree with you. They've been more severe than what, you know, just that letter bothers me, I have to be honest with you. Well, we have to understand that this system, the main system, was probably put in 50s. I don't know, I've lived there 41 years. Okay. It wasn't built for the storms we're getting now. It was built probably for a 10-year event at that time. That was all that was mandatory to be built, you know, for a 10 year event. Now we're getting 100 year events twice a year and maybe a 200 year event that they think that one on June 16th was. So we're under the, we understand that a lot of our major systems aren't 
adequate to meet these storms, but it's also a budgetary problem. We don't have $5 million to go down Medford and put that new storm sewer out of the township without getting grant money. And that's probably what it will take from 45th Street to 55th Street. We'll probably take about $5 million. When you do that, that solves the problem from 54th to 45th. But wouldn't do anything from 55th down to 55th. Oh, we're going to include part of 55th heading east on that second phase. That's already been talked about by our engineers. All right. Well, whatever you can do. We are trying. Believe me, sir, what you are trying, sir. You want, you want you your You can have that if you like. Anybody wants it? Joe, if you want. Sure, I'll take it with you. We, we do appreciate the time. The time was this. Appreciate your comments, as Joe's alluded to. He will he will follow up tomorrow, as indicated. Do we have anybody else that's in the public in the crowd that wishes to address the board of trustees? Any specific township business matters? If so, I ask that you state your name and your address for the record. Sir, go ahead. My name is Bill Weaver, 1900B, Woodville Avenue, Northwest Campus. And the reason I am here, as usual, is we understand that the um, magistrate has finally handed down a decision about helping clean up the property next door to us. Um, what we're just urging is that we continue to try to get the rest of it cleaned up. Um, it has a horrible hardship on our, on our business. We have people telling us they're going to cancel because of the mess next door. They're not going to book because of the mess next door. And it's just gotten so far out of hand. So we respectfully requesting that we stay on that and get it cleaned up. Um, that's all I have to say at this time. Okay. okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to address this board with any township specific business? <laughs> Okay, that's going to conclude public speaks. Uh, Mr. Rose, I do see Mr. and Mrs. Ward in the audience, and I did just want to let them know that I have some information in regards to the littering in the neighborhood. Um, aside from Mr. Um, Falk and I sending a letter to um, the businesses that we talked about, um, I am working with the Stark County Sheriff, um, George Meyer, and he is going to work with the um, the um, inmates, and I know that you may have seen them, you know, on various parts of um, on highways cleaning up litter. And when they are out there, they he will with his um, staff and have them come over on that area of Endro and do some cleanup also. So we have worked on that. And um, Denny, I don't know if he has talked to you. He can talk to you after the meeting. He has some information about the vacation vacating Endro. So make sure you see Mr. Falk afterwards. He's got some information to give you about that also. I'd like to thank you very much. Our pleasure. Okay. Go back just one last time. There's nobody that wishes to address the board for the sake of public speech. Okay, that will close out our public speech. That is going to take us to concerns of trustees. And I believe, Mr. Giovasis, you had an update regarding meeting you were at during our last board meeting representing this township on drain, drainage, flooding, river ditch, so. Um, yes, myself and um, I was superintendent, Mr. Iceno, we did attend a meeting at the North Kent Civic Center in regard to the Zimmer ditch in the first round of <coughs> uh, money that was awarded and at that meeting um, that wasn't disclosed at that time which property owners were going to be included in the first phase. Um, they're going to, uh, they're anticipating awarding that to 10 property owners. They, uh, they ranked the properties um, that were included in that initial phase. I think there was 67 
applicants that wish to have their properties bought out along the zipper ditch. Um, there was only one that was included in the township. That's a gaslight circle. Uh, Arboretum circle, I apologize. Um, there's going to be a second phase. Um, out of the first 10 that are picked, they're going to do their appraisals and make offers to those property owners. If any of those property owners decide to pull out, they would go to the 11th, 12th, 13th, based on that internal ranking. I do not have to solve that while we were there during the meeting. Um, there's going to be a second phase applied for. We need to make sure that we get in contact with properties that are in the township outside of the one that was already included to make sure that um, when that second phase does go forward and those properties are included. Um, there was a lot of discussion and desire to, you know, to work a little bit closer with the township. Um, um, this next go around, uh, Perchering did a fabulous job during the meeting. Um, just at this point, we're not going to have a whole lot of uh, headway on any of the issues <coughs> relating to you know, township properties outside of one in our greater circle. Um, um, that pretty much summed it all up, and then we were told that we would be notified in the next meeting, the next go around. I don't know if Joe has anything different. Well, I mean, they, I, they received $1.5 million in that grant, and they're getting it in two phases. Uh, it sounded to me like the local government's not picking which homes get on that first mm -hmm. list, the state is picking them through whatever process they're using. Then they'll go from, all right, we're going to get an appraisal, you know, go out and do this. If you turn it down, we're going to put it down the list. So that's basically it. Did they allude to, by any chance, what they would look to do with those properties once they buy them? I'm just thinking along the lines similar to where the old pathway carry for children built, building was right along that Zimmer ditch where that got leveled. That got transitioned over to Stark Parks to be preserved as a green space for it. That that be the same intent. Well, they had representatives from the Muskegon watershed there, and they are doing a study of the whole watershed, which was it, like eighty thousand acres or something like that. Yeah. They know retention basins and detention basins they put in throughout the area, but they just don't want to spot one here, spot one there, and they're not really effective as they should be. So they are doing that study. Now they're getting a warning system of some sort put yes. on the home, but in the, on the properties on Long December Ditch and really bad areas log into on here. that will um, give you the height of the you know the, the creek and everything that's going on, tell you when to evacuate actually, and then it keeps their numbers so they can look forward as part of this study to, to do some retention areas. Once they tear those houses down, I'm sure there's going to be a great opportunity probably for retention in, in those areas. Where it's going, so you know, but nothing will be done, Scott, from what I understood quickly with retention or detention. Okay, thanks for making sure we were represented there. Is there anything, Trustee Lino, do you, do you have anything under concerns of trustees? Thank you. Okay, that closes concerns of trustees, concerns of the fiscal officer. Not this Mr. Fox is good. That takes us to the approval of the minutes for August 26, 2014, which I will still move on. I will second it. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Lino? Yes. Mr. Hoff? Yes. There is a need for executive session, so be it hereby resolved by the Clay Township Board of Trustees, Stark County, Ohio, to adjourn to executive session. It's 7.38 p.m. from this regular meeting is authorized under Ohio Revised Code 121.22G for the purpose and consideration of 1A, appointment of a public employee or official, 1B, Employment of a public employer official, 1C, dismissal of a public employer official, 1D, discipline of a public employer official, and 3, a conference with the law director or other retained counsel concerning pending or imminent court action. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Mr. Lino? Yes. Mr. Giavesis? Yes. Mr. Ha? Yes.